Welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm Bill Fralick from WTCM Radio News, your host for this weekly roundtable of some of the stories making headlines across northern Michigan with the journalists that are covering those stories. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the program a full table this week. We've got Pat Sullivan from Northern Express. Pat, welcome back. Thanks, Bill. We've got Dennis Mansfield from the uh, leader in Kalkaskian, Kalkaskia County. First time for you. Thanks for coming. And Jakob Wheeler from the Glen Arbor Sun. Welcome back to you. It's been a while. Good Thanks. to see you back. Appreciate it. We want to do, uh, I guess first we want to do a couple of uh, introductions just by way of uh, who some of the, the new guests are, so to speak. And Dennis, your first time on the show. Uh, tell us about your job at, at the, uh, the Leader in Kalkaska, the paper there. Well, it's, it's actually my second tenure at the Leader. Um, I was editor and then publisher from about 2003 to 2006. Um, and I went off to the world of public relations, and I've, I've come back and uh, took back the reins of editor um, early September of last fall. And I call I'm what I call myself a working editor. Uh, a lot of people think editors just sit around a desk somewhere, but I, I, I get out there. I take photos. I cover stories. I cover meetings. Uh, do a little sports if uh, Mike needs me to, which when he's warned me he's going to take a vacation, so <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll help him out. But I do every little bit of everything. So. And how often do you publish? Uh, once a week. We come out on each Wednesday. So 52 editions a year, every Wednesday. Great. And uh, Jakob Wheeler, Jakob, you've been here before, but as we were talking a moment ago, it's been almost a full year since you were around. So just remind the folks uh, what you do at the Glen Arbor Sun. You're also one of those editors and publishers who doesn't just sit at the desk and, and edit. <laughs> I, sometimes I wish I had the luxury of sitting at the desk and drinking coffee. No, we all, we, we all work hard these days as journalists. I'm the founding editor and publisher of the Glen Arbor Sun newspaper, which publishes um, primarily seasonally in southern Leelanau County. Um, features on what's going on, recreational for the tourists, where to, where to hike, where to eat, where to buy real estate, and so on. But you know, a lot of analytical features as well about um, environmental issues and so on, and issues going on with the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Um, <clears throat> we publish during the summer months, but also with, through GlenArbor.com, our website, publish content year-round now. And we see, you know, I, I get a, an email blast every every now and then too. So you guys are you're constantly with with your staff. So tell me about who's on the staff and, and how often you're putting out content. Well, got um, a couple great co-editors. One is uh, my dad, Norm Wheeler, a uh, poet and musician. He's a co-editor. And um, Michael Bueller, who uh, lays out and designs the magazine. He's also co-owner of the Leelanau Coffee Roasting Company in Glen Arbor. And we've got um, several de devoted staff writers who, um, who pen great, great pieces. Um, uh, Kathleen Stocking, the author, author of Letters from the Leelanau, um, Josephine Arrowood is one more, um, very literary writers who also can play the role of journalist. Um, Anne-Marie Oman, uh, the local writer, mm -hmm. pens quite a few pieces for us as well. Great. Well, I want to talk about some of the stories uh, making news headlines this week, and we're going to start close to home in Traverse City. Uh, Pat, you and I have been uh, following this story for, it's only been 24 hours at this point, but a uh, story in uh, East Bay Township of a, of a body that was found yeah, uh, we, by a couple of horseback riders. We learned yesterday that out in East Bay Township, I assume some pretty remote area, they found a body that was clothed, uh, what, 25 to 35 year old man, and they don't have any idea who he was. Last I heard, they didn't have any idea who he was. We're right. hoping to find out something about him today. They said that there were no signs of trauma, so they don't know how he died. Uh, they're going to do an autopsy, and it'll take a while before we find out what the results of that is. So, I mean, it's a, I guess it's a mystery that how did this young man wind up dead in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere? Right. Take us through uh, the process of what we've heard and, and when we heard it. This happened around 5 o'clock Tuesday evening, um, you know, 24 hours later, Wednesday. We still knew very little, uh, but take us through, you know, the timeline of, of what we're hearing. Uh, we found out about it yesterday morning when we Wednesday. went to Wednesday yesterday morning when we went to the uh, daily meeting at the sheriff's department and the police department, and they gave us a press release that had just about the information that we just discussed, yep. uh, and then that's pretty much all we found out about it, except that they narrowed down the location later in the day to a section in. In East Bay Township. In East Bay Township. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, you and I were joking about that just a minute ago. We had been told for reasons of the investigation, they didn't want to tell us where this had happened specifically uh, in the morning. 
and I got that, and I wasn't gonna like I, I wasn't gonna go out there and take a picture or anything. I just but I was curious because I saw I I'd never seen like normally you get a road like an intersection. Right. And those, I, I I assume that they gave us this because there's no road out there. Like it's just but it's a, it's and I am familiar with this like on in the the town or the the townships are broken down into sections. Um, and I, but I was curious like and I put it into Google East Bay Township Section 31 to see if. Does, does Google Maps know what that right. is? Because that, that had no idea. What yeah, and that's I, kind of the answer that we were given was this is where it is, section 31. Right. Which was kind of, you know. It was like, okay, so it's another riddle. Right, we need a little clarification. And, and I, we did, I did find out, you know, it's in the area near Three Mile and Potter Roads yesterday. Um, but again, that was one of those things where we wanted to get out some kind of information and the update was section 31. So that just left more <laughs> questions than answers. Yeah, I suppose, you, you, how did you figure it out? Uh, just by following up with, uh, with Sheriff's mm -hmm. Office and saying, Section 31. I didn't know if that, was something that, if that was something that people... Yeah, yeah I didn't... I, I didn't know how to figure that out. I've lived in East Bay Township for 10 years and that didn't help me one bit. So. Is there no mass cordon of yellow tape like we see in the movies? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we didn't know where to look. That was yeah. uh, you know, part of the problem, uh, yeah. not knowing where to go. So we're still looking for, uh, for follow-up information on that. Uh, Dennis, let me turn over to you. Uh, first off, I guess I want to talk about probably the biggest story in northern Michigan of the year so far was the accident about 10 days ago in Kalkaska uh, involving the, the Grayling Golf Team uh, as well as uh, a family, uh, grand, uh, grandmother, mother, and granddaughter uh, from Kalkaska County. And Mike told us he was here last week, your sports guy, that, that you were out there on the scene as well. What a, what a terrible day for... Uh, for being a news reporter? Unfortunately, I was, yeah. Uh, and it happened actually on our production day. And uh, I, I got out there and, and I almost wasn't mentally prepared for what I saw. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was a horrific. Uh, one deputy, when I walked up, said, I said, well, what is it? He just said, a mess. And that might be an understatement, but it was very accurate. And uh, Later, I found out actually the coach was a guy I bowled with hmm. uh, in Grayling. I'm actually from Grayling, so uh, I'm a Grayling High School graduate. So, actually, I'm glad I didn't know that until I got back to the office because this one kind of hit a little bit close to home. Yeah. And uh, it's it's nice to though to see the response from other schools, other communities uh, here in Northern Michigan uh, being so supportive. Um, of course, uh, you know, we don't want to forget about the Kalkaska family either. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you um, that. A lot of the attention naturally, I think, goes to the, the golf team, the, so many players, yeah. young, young people involved. But you've got a mother of three who died in that second vehicle, uh, and her mother was injured and daughter was taken to the hospital. So there's a local connection yeah. for it, a separate I, community. It's, it's understandable being, you know, a high school golf team or, or any team, um, it, they're going to, you know, the news is going to gravitate to them, but yeah, the, the local family, uh, the funeral uh, for Cassie was this Tuesday, so a memorial fund has been set up. Uh, through the funeral for, home, right? Uh, through the funeral home, um, and uh, so that's that's something that hopefully people will rally around in Kalkaska too, um, so we don't want to forget them. We don't want to for, forget the golf players because there's still two who have a long way to go. Um, mm -hmm. From what I understand, um, they're still putting the pieces back together. I mean, there, there's a lot of healing all, that's already going on, but it's going to be a long way to go for a, a few of these kids. I want to ask you one more question on, on that. Take me through what goes on in your newsroom that day, trying to figure out who's who, who's involved. Um, does social media play a role? Um, I mean, that's kind of how it, I figured out who did. Cassie was and figured out she was a yeah. mother. And, um, that's actually how I kind of figured out uh, it, it was people I knew. Mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, being a weekly, I, I have a little bit more time as far as going, okay, I don't have to, to put it on air that second or something. I, and, and I had talked to the, the Michigan State Police Sergeant at the scene. I knew I was going to get a release that night. Um, but on, on Facebook, all of a sudden things started popping up, and I'm like, uh oh, I, I know these people. Yeah. And I recognize the names. And uh, that's, that's when it became a little bit more personal. 
Yeah. Um, but, it, but it did help. I mean, I was able to message people via Facebook, are you sure, you know, was, and, and they, were, they were confirming details rather quickly. Um, in fact, they released, uh, one friend released the name of the, the golf team members involved before the state police ever did. So it, as a journalist, it almost kind of made you nervous, like, okay, this is not the official channels I'm used to getting it from. Right. Um, but it but it was there and it, and it was public and and, and so we went with it so yeah. it, it was tough different. day tough day i want to come back to another uh, story in your neck of the woods in just a minute but Jakob, let me turn it over to you one of the stories making national headlines over the past weeks and months is the the sequester and uh you know we found out um weeks ago that the sequester is hitting kind of all communities all across the country glen arbor sleeping bear dunes is no exception mm. <coughs> that's right <coughs> Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore over in Leelanau County and Benzie County has been forced to cut their budgets uh, for, 20, for fiscal year 2013 by 5%. Um, initially, the park staff pushed for or suggested an across-the-board furlough where every employee would feel the hit, maybe a few less hours or whatever. But um, we've learned that officials in Washington um, said, no, if you're a full-time uh, park employee in the office, you've got to stay. It's the seasonals and the part-time workers who have to take the, the hit. What that means effectively is that the park has had to, to um, the places that are open seasonally, such as Pure Stock and Scenic Drive is the best example. This picturesque, wonderful eight-plus mile mm -hmm. drive with, um, with several views of the, of the uh, of the dunes and of the lake, which is really a big hit with the elderly and with school groups because you don't necessarily have to get out and walk five, six miles. There are just these beautiful views from parking lots. Um, that's in lieu of it being open from April until November, which it typically is, right. it's not going to open until Memorial Day weekend, um, May 25th, which I believe is the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, and then it'll close again right after Labor Day. Um, and the, the fear in Glen Arbor and elsewhere is that, um, you know, obviously Glen Arbor is known for its tourism, but a lot of businesses in Glen Arbor have been building up their shoulder seasons, building up their fall tourism season after Labor Day. Uh, you know, a lot of people still come up here for the great color tour and to spend money right. and so on. And now there's this fear that with the park um, scaling back and not offering some of its amenities in the fall, it might dissuade or it, it, some folks from coming or at least, you know, hurt what they get when they're here. We talked uh, at the radio station with, with Sleeping Bear as well. Take me through what your understanding is, though, of, of it, it, it's a, a scenic drive. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a gate. Like you said, there are places to pull over. There are parking lots. So the question naturally was, okay, why can that not be opened? You know, what, what's involved logistically or man hours wise that prevents you from unlocking a gate and just letting people for years have it was. free access. I mean for years, wasn't it? It was Exactly. Yeah. Um, the park, <coughs> I believe in the <coughs> excuse me, the mid to late nineties began collecting fees at Pier Stock and Scenic Drive, at the Dune Climb, and then there's a volunteer more or less a voluntary um, fee payment in, in a few other places. So they they have a fee booth there. Um, <coughs> they're not going to be collecting fees, but they've actually put down gates so you can't get in. The rationale that I've been told um, by the park is um, that it takes a bit of work to, to clear the road of, of, of sticks, branches that may have fallen over the winter, uh, to put out um, you know, parts of the removable walkways from the parking lot to some of these beach overlooks. I actually biked it yesterday, um, even though it's not open. I'm a journalist, I do that sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I didn't see much debris in the way. Um, I didn't see a lot of sticks or, 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 or leaves or whatever that would pose a danger to a biker or a walker. Um, but it's true that a lot, of the, um, a lot of the temporary wooden walkways have not been put out there. So their rationale is, um, the park's rationale for not opening it, not just opening the gate and letting anybody go through, is um, you know, there's no one to staff it to maintain things that may or may not happen. Restrooms. I should say re restrooms are closed, trash containers are, I think, welded shut more or less. Um, there's been a bit of a of a mess at the at the at the dune climb in that um, most of the um, the trash containers are shut. Um, a couple days ago, I saw um, a few tourists, presumably tourists, leaving trash on the side on the ground right in front of the dune climb. That was, however, cleaned up yesterday, which um, leads me to believe that park employees, some park employees, went you know above and beyond the call of, of their typical job and went out there and cleaned up trash, which is probably a good idea given that 
it would be a public relations nightmare for them and for the whole area. Yeah, it seems so unfortunate to have to to go to this extreme. Uh, is it? Do you find it hard to not have an opinion about this kind of thing as as a journalist? I mean, this is just it's, it's your own backyard. It's your own yeah. national treasure. Well, I find it hard uh, to, not to have an opinion about a lot of things, but <laughs> yeah, I mean. The most important thing here for me has been, you know, just to, re to report it really, re to really report it straight for people. I mean, I think that there's, there can be a palpable sense that they will, people want to blame the local park officials, where it's not, it's not the local park officials' fault, really. I mean, this is, this is a problem of indecision and gridlock in Washington, right. largely between President Obama and the Republican House of Representatives. So the park is just doing what it was told to, and the local park officials are just doing what they were told to by their superiors. It wasn't their decision to have to close things. One of the decisions they made, though, was not to uh, not to kind of degrade services across the board, but to, to degrade services only in the key areas, so that they can maintain a high level of performance. I'm speaking of the St. Mary's National Lakeshore in most places, because they recognize, and this is you know kind of the other extension to the story that I'm covering how much the Sleep Mergers National Lakeshore gen generates economically for the local economy, for local businesses. The park put out a study um, a few months ago that it generated millions and millions of dollars in 2011 for the local economy. And um, you know, I think there are some people who were upset that there was a land grab and that, and that land was, was, uh, was taken for the park many years ago. But everybody will admit that it's a huge boon to the local economy, probably the biggest boon. And so we're, you know, we may feel some of it now, how much right. the park means. The, uh, and, and I guess the last point on that, too, when I mean, we talked about the, the scenic drive, uh, but a, another example of the, the school tours, you mentioned the school kids, uh, you know, not being able to go to the visitor center except between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Well, and the visitor that, center that is open. They can, um, the, but, they, but they don't get those there. tours from the correct from the uh, park park staff. And, and I know at my kids' school, they've got the tours now scheduled for the first week of June, which is really the only time any school can get in there. Obviously, with the summer season, so right. do what you can on that. All right, let's swing back around this way, Pat. You've got a story uh, that you're working on this week. Uh, involving uh, what the prosecutor's office in Grand Traverse County. We've got a new prosecutor this year. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Cooney was elected prosecutor. Uh, he took office in January. And we uh, haven't heard much from him. No. Well, it's been kind of quiet. I mean, yeah. there haven't been there, there really haven't been any big high-profile cases. We'll see about what happens with his body. Who knows? Yeah. But um, the uh, it's been it's been kind of quiet, like in terms of what you see in the in the. In the top, the headlines, but I've noticed I go in just to um, check on what's going on in the courthouse. I go in a few times a week and look at what's filed, uh, what what cases have been filed in the last couple of days. And because for a long time I just look at the felony files because uh, there were only two or three a week, and I could just look at the files and read and see if there's anything worth looking into. Sure. And th but then the, starting in January, I started to notice. I'm spending a lot more time sitting here in district court looking through files because, and I realize like week after week, it's like there's two or three, there, there, there's t more than twice as many files that I'm looking at now. Than you used to. Yeah. Um, and it was more time that I, you know, I was spending more time there. So um, I, when, the, when the first quarter passed, I checked the, uh, went to the district court and I checked how many felony cases had been opened. Uh, the first quarter this year, I think 117 felony cases have been opened. Um, same quarter last year, it was something like, I, I want to I should have brought it with me, but around 48 or something like that. So it was more than double. Yeah. Uh, the, and if you look at 2011 and 2010, that number was higher, but it still was a remarkable increase this year compared to uh, the last year and the, the two years before it. So I talked to a couple of defense attorneys who said, yes, there's a new prosecutor in town, and he, he, he's um, charging things that weren't getting charged before as felonies. And he's much more severe, and he, he's a lot tougher prosecutor. And you know, maybe he's settling in, and, fi and maybe this will settle down, or maybe it's the you know. But they definitely said, yeah. I mean, we're really crowded in court now. Things are are, are really starting to pile up. Uh, and I talked to Bob Cooney about it, and he said. He, he didn't think that he was doing anything any different than what Al Schneider did or uh, even Dennis LaBelle before him. Um, he, except for he's, he's taking more cases from Pugsley. And we've noticed that 
that there have been more drug cases from Pugsley. Uh, prison there in yeah. the Kingsley. So he's taking drug cases from Pugsley. That accounts for some of it. Um, so is there a specific uh, a type of felony crime that, that we're seeing, or is it just across the board, everything is kind of getting bumped up in intensity a little bit? I don't know. It, and it depends on, I mean, I didn't sit down and like do an analysis of, of what's been charged. You see a lot of um, like stolen credit card cases, and you see a lot of um, financial c cases, and I don't know whether you s would have seen those last year. But Bob Cooney said that he believes it's because we're, we're kind of coming to a shift where we're actually seeing more complaints from police, um, which at first you think, well, I mean, all of a sudden when he takes office, there's all of a sudden, like, right. so does that really, could that make sense? But then I looked at the, at the number of misdemeanors, and those are up too from this quarter last year. So it's not like there's more misdemeanors, there's more felonies and fewer misdemeanors. It's like over, he, I mean, yeah. everything is up. So maybe he has a point. Maybe mm -hmm. there's, I, I mean, I guess we'll find out when we have more time to look at. And year to year. Interesting. Dennis, I'll uh, come back to you. We had election day this week all across the state of Michigan. Uh, and a big issue in Kalkaska County, the proposal to, to buy or to build rather a new library. And I know that that uh, existing library, from what I understand, has been in the same spot for what, 50, 60 years? Since uh, 1940. So we're so going on 73 years. 70 plus. Wow. Uh, and and, and it, it, most of the people I talk to, um, like online lunch or, or whatever, th they agree that library needs to be replaced. Um, there's really no room for expansion. Um, they're really hemmed in on the property that they're at. Uh, it's a two-story building. Most people who have a public bi building will tell you they want to get it on one floor, if at all possible, uh, to, to help with uh, handicap issues, et cetera. Um, that wasn't really the, the, the issue. Um, it, it went down, what, two to one margin? It went down right? hard. Uh, two to one margin, about uh, 1,654 votes no. 820 uh, yes. yes, and I mean in every precinct it went down. So, and that surprised me. I kind of went into Monday night, Tuesday morning thinking this is a coin toss. Uh, apparently I was wrong on that. And, and in talking to a couple people since, and not people closely involved, they're just like, it, it's not this no new taxes, which was kind of the chant of one side. Uh, nor is it, you know, we don't need a Taj Mahal from others. It's just, you know, right now this is a bad time. Uh, we just don't want to add to the bill right now. Um, and plus I think there was a little bit of lack of information from the library. Normally I've been covering such issues for over two decades. A school issue, they have a drawing, a conceptual drawing or something, some kind of plan to show people, hey, this is what you're going to get for your money. And the library wanted to not involve an architect or anything in those drawings, didn't want to go through that expense until they had a voter approval. And I think that hurt them because people are like, well, wait a minute, I'm going to give you almost $11 million over 20 years, Four, about 3.8 would have built the actual building and the rest to operate it. What am I giving the, you this money for? And people want that, you know. And I don't think it was a matter they don't want better things for the community. Uh, just a little while ago, they, they approved uh, renovation of school buildings and a new uh, gymnasium. Um, and, and if you look at a couple of the townships that are on the periphery, uh, in very small numbers, voted yes. Like one uh, Bear Lake Township uh, touches Crawford Sable Schools in Crawford County. They actually voted, I think it was nine to six, so very small again. But they voted in favor of a busing and technology issue for that, and even uh, approval of a, a millage for Kirtland Community College, okay. but then turned around and voted no on the library. So I'm hoping the, li the library people go back, maybe get a little bit more community involvement in putting something together. And, and I think they need to, to start over their, their public relations campaign to and as I understand their current millage runs out at the end of this year so they've either got to this come is back the, in the this fall is the it. really tricky part they they have right now a, um, a quarter mill 
for operations that does expire at the end of December. Um, and now they're under the gun to get that approved. So maybe they didn't have money to come up with an architectural drawing. Um, I, I think they did. Like I said, they, they, they just didn't want to go through the expense yet. And, and again, I think that, that cost them. But, uh, and that's understandable. You're right, they don't have a large amount of money to, to go and spend, but they, they, they could have gotten that, and they, and they didn't. And, uh, but now they have to go to the voters, and hopefully voters don't confuse it and say, wait a minute, you're coming back again, we just voted no on this. And understand that it's, wait, this is the operational millage. And because there are going to be several other millage issues, uh, animal co control, recycling, um, there's a possible road millage, countywide road millage that could be on the ballot uh, later this fall. So either. we could have a clogged ballot there. So, and, and a couple of the county commissioners said, you know, are you sure you want to do this in the order that you're doing it? And the, this library board, that's a proposal they put forward and they got approved to get on the ballot. and. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. We'll see if so. it, it doesn't backfire, which, which is very concerning because all of a sudden if you don't have that operational knowledge, what does that mean for the future of the library? Yeah. Uh, people could lose their jobs or something. And we just went through uh, the county board cut $700,000 from their budget last year. And there, there were people who ended up without jobs. So we've already gone through that once in Kalkaska County. I wouldn't really want to see it happen again. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, we've just got a, a couple of moments left here. Jakob, let me turn back to you. Any, anything that's on your horizon for the rest of the summer as, as you look to what's going on in, in Glen Arbor and, and in Leelanau County? Is this, uh, are, we, are we talking tourism? Are we back to cherries? What are we uh, looking at here for the coming months? You know, obviously, it, <coughs> things are good for the farmers, right? There's there, plenty of runoff and, and water from all, that, from all that snow. It should be a good farming season. You know, I mean, I, at this point in the year, when I'm kicking the Glen Arbor Sun into gear, I'm looking for just great feature stories, great, great stories about eccentric and accomplished locals and, and seasonal residents, and there seem to be plenty in Leelanau County. So. That's great. Well, tell us, uh, finally, uh, again, your GlenArborSun.com. GlenArborSun.com. Um, we publish content year-round about life in Leelanau, and um, the Glen Arbor Sun will publish its first edition May 23rd this year from Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend. Um, We'll be out every two weeks. Perfect. Thanks for coming in, Jakob. Appreciate it. Uh, Dennis, the leader in Kalkaska, do you guys uh, have a website as yep. well? Tell Le us how to find you. Uh, LeaderInKalkaskian.com, and we're also on Facebook, so uh, we're online, Facebook, uh, and obviously the, the traditional print version, which a lot of people <laughs> still hold dear to their hearts. God bless them. So. Fabulous. Dennis Mansfield, thanks. And Pat, you guys uh, on Northern Express? Yep. NorthernExpress.com? I think so, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Northern, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And I want to thank everyone for, uh, for tuning in this week. I'm Bill Fralick from WTCM Radio. Thanks for watching The Briefing Room, and we hope to uh, see you again next time.